long story short, my dissertation work sort of focused on this this re-embracing of what is, um, I think, most our most common way of of interacting with nature in, in most of human civilization, which is to have some amount of self-production, some amount of um, connection to to the land through activities in the home, you know, home economics and, and small scale food production and um, other kind of craft economies. Um, that ties in with this larger scale critique I have that kind of the, the best um, language I've ever heard uh, of this critique is basically Paul Kingsnorth, um, his con concept of the machine. Um, and basically the machine is, is in the, in the broadest possible sense, the, uh, the industrial technological civilization. Um, I think a lot of people just don't really realize because it's been a couple of generations for most of the developed world living in this advanced economy that this is really um, the anomaly mm -hmm. in most of human history. Um, most of hum human history wasn't lived this way. And so um, that that machine critique kind of fits into my 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 work all over the place. You know, I'm, I'm interested um, in my academic research on on food systems, but I think in my life, I've taken that similar critique to women's issues to family life um, on a personal level. Um, so I think about the ways in which um, the, the, the thrust of industrial technological civilization um, is in many ways about putting, you know, every aspect of human life into the marketplace as, as possible um, to make these Faustian bargains of advancing technological civilization at the expense of any, any of the above. Um, and so I, um, yeah, so I think the, the connection is this, this idea of um, the ways in which the, the machine and advanced technology kind of have its tentacles in so many aspects of our life. It, in some ways, it's even hard to see. It's almost like the water we swim in um, so it's, it's, it, it takes some unpacking to see the, the connections, but in the same way as, as, um, industrial agriculture, for example, is high, highly, um, uh, reliant upon technology, um, highly specialized, um, less and less people, you know, have like a decentralized control over, you know, what <laughs> in Marxist terms we call the means of production. Um, the same thing is true with human women's bodies, for example, you know, just just sort of outsourcing everything that's possible to be outsourced to um, the profit, a pro profitable mechanism, ways in which we can commodify um, human bodies, women's bodies. Um, and yeah, it, and a lot follows from that. But I think um, this is what sort of ties together my work in general, that um, my interest in women's issues is is born out of my, being a mother um and and kind of realizing the extent to which commodification and the profit motive has really um sort of impacted um some of the most sacred i would say um but also the most empowering aspects of what it is to be a human um and have control over your own destiny self-determination you know self-reliance and all of that that um that idea of the sacred is something I think about a lot and whether or not it's really possible for people to continue having any conception of the sacred if they don't, if there's nothing upstairs, you know, if they don't believe in God, if it's not fitting into some um, theological or, or supernatural scheme, can we still think of things as sacred? I think people tend to feel that things are sacred. Um, and, and would you say, I mean, bearing in mind, that, of course, that Paul Kingsnorth is a Christian writer, so 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 he he is he's fitting the idea of the machine in, into into that um, comprehensive worldview that Christianity offers. Do do you see this idea of the of the machine as being fundamentally at odds with the idea of the sacred? Yeah, I do, and um, so a l this is something. I'm exploring on my podcast more and more um, re in recent 
months, which is um, I'm coming to the conclusion. Um, I guess let's step back a second and and say um, in I would I would argue that in the industrial modern era in the in the era of nation states you either have um, the outsourcing of social norms to um, the marketplace mm -hmm. or to the state and it's a relatively new phenomenon to have um, expectations that social norms would be fully outsourced to these sort of I inhumane um, institutions. So like the nation state is a relatively new social technology. Um, and right now, the majority of the conversation is about, um, you know, leftists saying the nation state can handle the social norms we need um, to, to have a functioning society. And conservatives or more right leaning people tend to think the market can handle those um, and I would fundamentally, uh, I think what what's missing from those left and right um, discussions is the ways in which um, social norms work um, interpersonally um, at the community level, at local, in between um, family members, um, in, in community members. And I think that there is fundamentally missing from most um political discussions is this um this realization that for example the state just simply cannot enforce certain norms if they get completely out of control it with anywhere as much um power as culture can so if you take that as an assumption then then it follows that whatever the culture is fundamentally does have to have a shared sense of what is sacred and what is profane to be able to make those judgments in between uh, family members or community members. Um, what I'm not convinced of is that there is there is a universal sacred and profane, but I, I am convinced that there needs to be some shared sense of what, what it is. Um, and it could be... Um, you know, for example, like a overlapping, two two overlapping Venn diagram type circles of uh, what is sacred and what is profane um, that are both Christian but look different in different communities or something like that. I'm 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 really interested in localism as a big part of the question of how do we move forward. Localism meaning local norms, community norms. You know that that differ place to place for for reasons. Um, for important reasons. And so, um, but at the same time, I've also really been um, embracing more and more my, um, my Christian upbringing um, and the sense that my sense of the sacred and the profane and my sense of what social norms um, what what is good? What is the good life? What is an appropriate way to act? Are are Judeo Christian <laughs> in nature, um, and I think it's okay to embrace that. I think um, one of the weird um, brain worms of modernity is this idea that it's like you must break with all um, traditions of the past because sometimes traditions came with some oppression, and therefore we should throw the whole thing out. But I think you're missing so much when you throw out. Um, what is effectively um, iterative morality that moved through time because it worked. I mean, it sort of worked through generations and, and, and evolved in the way that it did because um, it was functional in different um, circumstances, in different cultures, in different material circumstances. So I think it would be, it, it's, it, it's the, the right move in the um, current, system is to sort of, um, I think, both look back to those traditional ways in which people made clear what the, what was the sacred, what was a profane. Um, but without, you don't have to bring, you know, the whole of every uh, past tradition or past institution um, into um, your, your modern um, decision making about, you know, how to live a good life or how to be a moral person. Um, I think it's it's important to let those continue to evolve, but not 
um, feel like the need to start from scratch. I had somebody on the podcast recently who was talking about, you know, there's a lot of um, empty churches in um, the UK. And I think we should try to to, to <clears throat> use those churches to, um, his name is Adam, Adam Greenfield. He came on with Dougal Pine. Um, he said, I think we should try to bring these churches, we should try to use them as community centers and we should um, go there um, and, and have different rituals around the seasons and around people's parts of their life. And Dougal Hine was saying, you know, and what really works well is when there, there's like a founding mythology. I'm like, we're just describing a church. <laughs> um, we're really just describing a church here. Um, and it's funny because we a lot of people just end up sort of reinventing traditions uh, with different names. Um, but I do think it's okay to just, you know, a lot of people will, for example, um, be religious, but they'll look towards Buddhism or some sort of non-Western religion as a way of like exploring religiosity. And I think it's important to, um, and okay to look at your own heritage for, you know, figuring out those social norms of what is the good life and, and figuring out for, for you and for your own community, what is the sacred and the profane. And I would also just briefly add that um, there is a way in which the sacred and profane can be worked out um, through the like development of relationship. And by that, I mean, um, in a family, you can make a family culture around what is good, what is a good way to act, what is a, um, you know, what is appropriate morally. And then you can, you can build sort of morality through relationships, you know, in that relationship is the, the sort of ways in which people act that is good and appropriate you know, how to be loyal, how to be thoughtful, um, how to, how to, you know, be there for people when they really need you to be. Um, I don't really think it needs to be a top down sense of what is um, sacred and profane, but like a, a co-creative process by just sort of showing up and, and showing what works um, is a way in which I think we can sort of think about moving forward. <laughs>